Hello, I'm Sister Cindy, and for 44 years, I have been preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ on the college campuses. This is Brother Jed and Sister Cindy Smock, and they are Christian evangelists who are very appalled by atheism. If you buy her one margarita, she will spread her legs! <laughs> She is so edgy. Oh no, Mo! Oh no, Mo! <laughs> I am here to do some good old-fashioned slut shaming. Yeah! Feels good to be back on campus again. It doesn't feel like that long ago. I was out here, college student. Welcome home, old boy. Welcome home. She is savage, but then I see this crowd that is just like leaning forward, hanging on her every word. Obviously they're like chuckling and all that, but like they're very engaged. Hey everyone and welcome back to a new video. It's been a little while since I filmed and I feel like I'm out of practice. I've been on holiday to Austria, which has been absolutely lovely and was a much needed break from life. So if you're interested in seeing some of my photos from there, I am posting a selection over on Instagram, but I'm posting all of my holiday photos over on my Patreon account with a few thoughts of like, you know, what we did and where we went and just nice little ramblings like that. So if you're interested, you can go check them out. But today, <laughs> if you know me, if you've seen my content before, you might know that I kind of go through stages of being hyper-focused and like super ridiculously interested in certain topics and that often passes into the videos that I make and influences which videos that I make and that's what's happened today. At the minute I'm definitely going through a very like fundy focused stage where I'm responding to a lot of fundy influences and stuff like that and that's why today I am going to be talking about the latest Paul and Morgan collab video um, in their 24 Hours With series. This time they collabed with Sister Cindy, if you can call it a collab. <sighs> It was a lot. Let's talk about that. First up though, who are Paul and Morgan? Let's give you a very brief background if you've not seen me or anyone else talk about them before. So Paul and Morgan are a married couple of fundies who make videos about their beliefs, give relationship and parenting advice from a Christian perspective, and cover a lot of pop culture topics. This often manifests as them talking about how miserable they are in their marriage, repeatedly having arguments on camera and putting each other down, hating on everyone who isn't them, literally, producing increasingly transphobic and homophobic content, and some very clearly personal vendettas against certain celebrities like Taylor Swift or Dylan Mulvaney or anyone who is successful, basically. To put it very bluntly, Paul and Morgan are not nice people. The content they put out is harmful to a lot of people. I've never heard them be nice about anyone, I've never seen them support a cause that wasn't their own need to pay rent this month. They're just very kind of selfish in their motivations and in what they do and in the content that they put out. However, it's kind of difficult to watch them because you do feel sorry for them because they just have this increasing disdain for each other that is getting worse all the time. <laughs> We're getting to know each other in a little bit of a different way. Isn't it interesting, like thinking about, sorry, I'm reading no, through your all's comments, going back. You're ignoring what I just said, go ahead. <laughs> no, going back to the fertility treatments, like in a way you have a couple in the Bible that in a way brought in fertility. There are some people, trolls, who are always like, Paul is always making Morgan talk about her past. It's disgusting. He should be ashamed. You're no better, Paul, that you were a virgin and she wasn't. Okay, everyone, shut it. <laughs> Just where we end up kind of getting into an argument, and I'm like, oh. that didn't need to turn into an argument, and I don't think it would have turned. Oh, look, no, you know what? I'm ready to just push through, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. push through. This, but I thought my mom said it and she said, just gotta feed my cats. And I was like, mom got cats? But it was my sister. <laughs> okay, that's, that's, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> there have been times when I've done something or said something to Morgan that's been so hurtful. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, it's nice knowing, it's nice knowing that she can't go anywhere. <laughs> Okay, that doesn't give you the right to say mean things I to your wife. I feel guilty about it. Even though you literally were laughing, like the creepiest laugh I've ever heard, you were like, <laughs> 
it was so disturbing so okay, maybe you I'm did li- actually uh, that babe that is so rude <laughs> i will go <laughs> find that i will literally go find it right now on stream and oh the creepiest laughter i really didn't need to deliver i was really having fun no you know the laugh that i'm talking about Oh yeah about. I, exactly I, I literally left didn't i leave it in our video yeah and it's terrifying. because that's how unashamed i was of it it's creepy as heck and you know it i don't i, I disagree you were doing it on purpose like you were act you were just like being a doofus i think you're exaggerating N- okay no 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 <laughs> I, I literally do. Famous last words of a man. I think you're exaggerating. I'm just, I'm just keeping it real. No, like, no, I, I genuinely that's... think that you're exaggerating. Okay. Yeah. Everyone, you guys share your thoughts. But you my, guys share your thoughts. I'll see if I can find it. If I was exaggerating. I'll see if I can find it right very now. Very disturbing, creepy, weirdo laugh of Paul's. I, I disagree. <laughs> I mean, I was genuinely having fun. So I was like, <laughs> like, that's literally. I'll find it. It was worse than that, but that was also creepy. My point is, <laughs> oh, see, oh, oh, that was so creepy to Morgan. <laughs> Morgan's uh, over creepy. here. Creepy. So, okay, so that gives you guys perspective on, Morgan thinks it's incredibly creepy that I'm over here doing that. When I felt like Isaiah and the chat, I was looking over here and seeing these comments come in the chat, and I'm just like, whoa, like, they literally are. Play the video flame. and I'm, stop I'm, talking. I'll try to find it. Uh, this one says, I've thought slash considered divorce. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, but okay. It's thought. You said thought. I'm gonna cry. You said thought. <laughs> All right. <laughs> hey, come here. Come here. Come here. Oh, she's crying. All right. Uh, I did not expect that. Morgan has literally said in the past that she doesn't want to make their YouTube content anymore, but she has to because it's their job. She's currently pregnant with a second child that she did not want after nearly dying in childbirth the first time round and pretty much seeming to hate motherhood the entire time. So she's clearly not very happy with where they are in their life at the minute. Throughout all this, simply because Paul and Morgan are not interesting or enjoyable or educational to watch, and they're also really, really nasty to people and put out increasingly harmful content, their views have gone down, and as this is their only source of income, they are struggling financially. They've spoken about this a lot. They've recently had to downsize their house. It's difficult for them. In a last ditch attempt to bring in views and make a little bit more money, they are pouring what little money they have left into flying around the country to make a series called 24 Hours With, in which they interview other religious content creators. Some they agree with, some they don't. They kind of tout this as being, we're gonna talk to people who we don't necessarily agree with and try and, you know, hash out these conversations between Christians, but it still feels like a lot of the time they're living in an echo chamber. Unfortunately for them though, the series is not doing well and it's pretty clear to anyone watching or anyone who has a basic knowledge in how YouTube income works, they're probably not making their money back from this series. The videos are performing increasingly poorly and yeah, it's difficult to watch. Their latest video, which at the time of writing this script currently sat at under 8,000 views, is called 24 Hours with Sister Cindy. Paul describes this video as, I got to spend the day with an edgy campus preacher, Sister Cindy Smock, and watch her preach on campus. What I witnessed was wild. She turned heads with her colorful approach to evangelism. Brace yourself for fiery preaching, margarita songs, lively crowds, and a ho no mo revolution. It is also worth noting before we watch this video that interestingly Morgan was absent for this video which I was kind of speculating on but it just turns out she was ill so not a big deal Um, and Paul did not spend the full 24 hours with Cindy as advertised which led to some pretty hilarious posts like this one which was shared on the Funding Snark subreddit. Now, all jokes aside, the reason I want to discuss this episode is I think it raises some really important questions regarding religion, the harm it causes, purity culture and slut-shaming, 
and to some, maybe like a lesser extent, mental illness and exploitation of that. If you ask anyone who Sister Cindy is, the first thing that nearly always comes up is a debate whether she is mentally ill or not. She's known for going to college campuses in America and literally screaming in the faces of young women and teenagers, I mean also men as well, but it feels very very focused particularly on the women, um, and calling them misogynistic names like slut, whore, ho, and so on in an attempt to spread God's message. However, whether she's actually ill or not is a point which is hotly contended, and I honestly don't really have an answer. I don't know whether she is or not. I don't think we should necessarily be diagnosing someone based on videos we see online, but I do think it's important to mention it in the conversation. Sister Cindy is incredibly harmful and her behaviour is incredibly cruel, and there has been a lot of debate about whether she should be banned from campuses and things like that. But is it fair to critique her to that extent and point out her flaws to that extent and potentially ban her from places if it is coming from a place of genuine illness and delusion? Or should we be doing more to protect her by banning her if she is mentally ill? Is that how you protect and help people with delusions like this? Again, I don't know. I don't have the answers. In regards to this, there's a few things I just kind of want you to think about as we go through the video. A couple of questions I want you to ask yourself. Like, to what extent can we really be critical of a woman who is mentally ill? Should we be even asking whether a woman we haven't met in person but who is making a lot of online content and performing in public regularly, should we be a even asking if she is mentally ill or not? Does it even matter? If the content she's putting out is harmful, does it matter whether that was fueled by mental illness or not? If she is ill, how do we manage to critique and call out and correct her harmful behaviours without shaming her for something she can't help, like a mental illness? And another big thing that I kind of want to focus on here is, let's say she is mentally ill, let's say there is something wrong there. How ethical is it for people like Paul to interview and platform people like Sister Cindy in this way? Not only because she might be mentally ill, but also because she is causing harm with her words and actions. Is Paul legitimising her harmful behaviour? Is Paul taking advantage of a mentally ill woman for his own profit? Is there a way we can discuss these topics ourselves without being exploitative? <sighs> a lot of big questions that, like I say, I don't have the answers to, but they're something I've been thinking about a lot recently, and I would invite you to ask them and think about them as well as we go through this video. First up though, I just want to discuss who Sister Cindy is. If you haven't heard of her before, here's a little primer. For this, I am going to be referring mainly to a couple of wonderful posts made on the Fundy Snark subreddit, so a huge thank you goes out to these people for sharing this information and making my job a hell of a lot easier. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. I will leave this entire thread linked in my source list for this video if you want to go check it out for yourself. I do recommend it. So, Cindy, Cindy Smock, also known as Sister Cindy, became known on the back of her sadly now dead husband, who used to go by Brother Jed or Jed Smock, although no one really knows if this was his real name or how much of his background he made up. He seems quite an enigmatic character. Apparently both were pretty wild back in their college days. Jed was part of a fraternity which had a sex dungeon. I'm gonna need some proof of that, please. However, when he reformed his dirty, dirty, sinning ways, he became a travelling preacher where he met Cindy, who was also a wild child, and converted her too. My real name is Cindy Smock, and for 44 years I have been preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ on the college campuses. I'm a campus preacher. My husband and I take the confrontational approach to evangelism. We go out on the campuses and call the students to repentance and faith in Jesus. I was a student at the University of Florida, and I was just a unbeliever agnostic. I was really into the disco scene. One day I was walking by the library and I saw a crowd of people. I went over and looked in and it was Brother Jed preaching the gospel. And having studied journalism, I thought I might write an article about him. I had in my mind to try to seduce him and expose him. He had said he hadn't kissed a girl in six years. And I thought, I'm gonna get this man to kiss me and prove he's a hypocrite and a fake. So I tried to get him to kiss me, but he wouldn't. And that made me start thinking, maybe Jesus is real, maybe I need to know God. And in May, at the end of my third year, I dropped out and started preaching on the campuses. Master, 
creation is not natural. It is perverted and unnatural. Only perverts do it. So confrontational evangelism is arriving on campus and calling the students out for their sins and telling them that their only hope is repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It Mark Twain's in hell. That's where you're going to be this if you don't that. repent. If you read the Bible completely through, from Genesis through Revelation, I admit, if you just read parts of the Bible here and there, there'll be a lot of parts of it that appear to contradict one another. But once you read the whole thing you really, and put it together, you'll find that there are no contradictions. Do you really? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Since the 80s, both have been focused on street preaching, particularly at college campuses, and their methods have been compared to those of Westboro Baptist Church in terms of the way they often shout out at people, get in their faces, call them names, and really try to offend people. And also, they're not afraid to use colourful or vulgar language, as Paul likes to call it constantly. But other people say that Cindy is way more popular than someone like Westboro Baptist Church, uh, because she is funnier, louder, and almost always putting on a shocking act for the crowds. She definitely is a performer. You'll see that, you know, she's got a lot of confidence. She knows how to engage the crowd, get them, you know, cheering along, shouting things back to her, all that sort of thing. Cindy's main topics of conversation, though, are calling women sluts and hoes and other misogynistic insults, and shaming women for the clothes they wear, shaming people for being sexually active, and she has an odd obsession and vendetta against anal sex. So that's fun. This is quite an interesting take from one Reddit user that I want to read to you. They're popular because they are far more charismatic than the rest of the hateful street, street preachers. Don't get me wrong, they say the same horrible crap, but they have a pretty consistent sense of humour and really lean into theatrics. They yell at people, sing songs, make raunchy jokes, etc. Cindy specifically is notable for her absolutely bat poop facial expressions. The first time I encountered them, I thought it was performance art making fun of street preachers. What's more interesting is that this person claims Cindy is putting on a performance rather than being mentally ill, which would make her harmful behavior even more concerning and open to criticism, in my opinion. After three margaritas, she will grab your penis and put it in her mouth. Yes, there are a lot of low, low hoes. Watch out for the low, low hoes. Be a ho no mo. Be a whoremonger no longer. Who do you think has more hoes, Florida State or Florida? It is a neck and neck contest. There are lots of low, low hoes, but I think maybe Florida State has more hoes. or 12 dudes a week. Damn! Damn! She said, now I'm down to two or three. Damn! I go next! I am surprised to find a virgin here at UW-Madison. <laughs> and I have to admit, you look like a nice girl. But looks can be deceiving! <laughs> want somebody wandering around campus wearing the sacred never a hoe button and not really being a virgin. You get that. Who oh. so here is a hoe? Just so I know what we're doing. My, you're beautiful hoes.
So this person says, I do not agree with people saying she's just a mentally ill person and her behavior. I do not agree with people saying she's just a mentally ill person and her behaviour is the result of her being unwell. While I can't vouch for her being mentally healthy in general, I can say that the screeching and weird faces are something she appears to have complete control over. She turns it off when she's not preaching to a crowd or the camera, or at least she did a few years ago. Bo both of them, meaning Cindy and Jed, were pretty aware that the usual street preachers mostly get ignored, so they acted out in a way they know college-aged people will find entertaining to attract crowds of hecklers. But on the other hand, there are people who would describe her this way instead. As someone who had her come to my college, she is a very mentally ill crazy woman who comes to colleges to scream at everyone about Jesus. She will call the women sluts for showing ankles and crap. I honestly don't know why Paul would do this. Sister Cindy is actually crazy and not the good content for an interview crazy, but rather scary crazy with a tinge of sad crazy, craziness that just makes you sad. They go on to say, in my opinion, as someone with five mental problems in a society that actually cares about mentally ill people, she would be institutionalized and getting the help she ne desperately needs. So views are split. And even after watching all this content, I'm not quite sure what I think. I am edging towards the not mentally ill side of things, but it's impossible to say. I've only seen videos. I don't know. Finally though, just to give you an idea of who she is before we watch the Paul and Morgan video, I'm going to show you a few of Cindy's Instagram videos, including one of her shelling MLM products, including incredibly harmful weight loss products, to give you an idea of the kind of content she puts out. It's not, not enjoyable to watch, but enjoy! You got finals anxiety? Well, if you hadn't have tried to be a mega ho all semester, acting like you were majoring in oral or anal, you wouldn't have your major anxiety over your finals. You're really smart, but the problem is this semester, all semester, your brains have been down in your clit. Ho no mo. Sex is loads of fun. Sister Cindy, why does God want us to be a ho no mo? Doesn't he want us to have fun? And after all, God made sex. God did not call you to be a ho no mo because he doesn't like fun. God made his rules, his law, out of love for you. You experience fun outside of the boundaries of God's love, outside of the boundaries of holy matrimony. And when you do that, you take on the whole chain. It seems fun at first, but it's a heavy, heavy. Sex is loads of fun. Thinking about getting that shot, but you've heard about all the nasty side effects. You're smart. I've got you covered. These two things, my Plexus Slim Drink and Plexus Balance do the same thing that the shot does. It will help you lose weight in a similar way, but they're both natural and you don't get all the nasty side effects. Hit me up for this. You can get it for $125 plus I, if you order by the 28th, of April, you enter to win this iWatch. I'm giving away an iWatch. Yes, I'm doing a drawing if you order by the 28th. You're still a hoe? Are you kidding me? That is so 2019. There's a revolution going on. People are breaking the hoe chain and taking back their crown. Got a question for you. What's your highest goal in life? Mm-hmm, that's what I thought. Ho, no, mo. Ho, oh, no, mo, and your ho friends don't wanna hang with you anymore. You know why? You stink. The Bible says when you're a ho, no, mo, the hoes think you stink. You literally smell bad to them. 
and there's a Bible verse for that. And if you find it for me, I've got some merch for you. Stink on. So with all that in mind, let's jump into Paul and Morgan's collaboration, um, which is 24 hours with Sister Cindy, with a focus on her Ho No Mo campaign. That feels very unnatural for me to say. I'm from Yorkshire. Like American slang just doesn't sound right out of my mouth, does it? <laughs> If you don't have time to watch this whole video, here's a brief overview of my thoughts in general. It was thoroughly disappointing. <laughs> it's like 20% pointless stock footage, 10% footage of Cindy walking around, 50% footage of Cindy preaching on campus, which is exactly the same as what we've seen in other people's videos because she just does the same sermon all the time, 5% Paul asking students what they think of her, and 5% of Paul doing a bore it and 5% of Paul doing a boring basic never stretches below a surface level interview with Cindy, which kind of tells us nothing. Paul didn't ask her any interesting questions. He didn't go in depth with anything. He didn't challenge her on anything. I have so many more questions that I want to know the answers to after this video. I don't see the point in this. There's no new or interesting content here. Paul's insights don't add anything new, they don't add anything interesting. Why was he there? Let's watch it together and discuss. So this video opens with Paul saying that he had the opportunity to spend the day with Sister Cindy, but that it might be controversial because she's using colourful language, which means she uses misogynistic insults and name-calling towards people, especially young women. I had the opportunity to spend the day with Sister Cindy and join her while she headed off to campus to preach and do her thing. Sister Cindy has become a TikTok sensation, turning heads and drawing crowds. PSA, some of the language Cindy uses is quite colorful and will undoubtedly ruffle some feathers. We'll get to more on that. I ask that before making strong judgments about Sister Cindy, you watch the full video. Now enjoy perhaps our most controversial episode of 24 Hours With so far. The video then opens with shots of Cindy around what Paul labels the guest house. So it seems he wasn't like visiting her at home like he did with the other people in this series. Um, and it's actually unclear whether he himself was there for filming at this point in the morning, or if it was just his mum who was the camera person for that day, I, I don't know. We get some shots of Cindy doing her hair, pinning a ho no mo badge, it sounds so wrong out of my mouth, <laughs> badge to herself, reading the Bible, and then it cuts to one of her own TikTok or Instagram or both videos. It's literally just her saying that she's gonna be at some university calling people hoes or something. I've seen better introductions to people, to be honest. God has your number, and I'm coming your way today, noon at the amphitheater near the student center. I am bringing the ho no mo revolution to you. I think it would be good if Paul had given like a little overview of this is who Sister Cindy is, this is her past, this is what she's done. Like this as it is tells me nothing about her, who she is, her background, or what Paul hopes to achieve with this video. I feel like you need to have done your homework on who Sister Cindy is before you come into watching this, otherwise... It's telling me nothing. <laughs> the video jumps to 11am and... <sighs> look, I get the gimmick of putting times on screen when they're editing this, like they do 5.30am, 11am, 1pm and so on. I get the gimmick because it's meant to be 24 hours with, so they're trying to do the whole timeline thing, but they never actually spend 24 hours with these people. This one with Sister Cindy started at 5.30 a.m. and ended at 5 p.m. It's more like not quite 12 hours with, you know? The video is also, as I mentioned briefly earlier, interspersed with lots of stock footage, drone shots, footage of people walking. I am like 98% certain Paul did not film any of this. It's adding nothing, it's needless filler, and while these shots look good, that increase in quality is jarring against the quality of the rest of the footage, so it just kind of doesn't fit in. And actually, <laughs> this isn't in my script, but you know what this reminds me of? Um, 
So me and my friends, um, Andy, Sim and Craig, we went to go see The Room the other night at Cottage Road Cinema here in Leeds and it was amazing. Greg Sicestra was there doing a QA. and a I met him, he signed my book, it was fantastic. I was like proper fangirling a little bit in my head and um, we, oh, we had such a good giggle. It was really, really fun. There were spoons being thrown, brilliant, loved it. Um, but you know the shots in The Room, if you've seen it, where... <laughs> It's just like panning across the bridge and it just keeps going and going and going and going and going. Or they'll put in an establishing shot randomly of somewhere where the scene isn't taking place and everyone's like, okay, 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 okay. And it just never changes. They're the vibes I'm getting here. Okay, um, anyway, this is followed by 12 whole seconds of Cindy unpacking a car in which nothing ever happens. <laughs> Have no idea the effort we made to get out. <laughs> it's just filler. We didn't need this. Cindy then makes a TikTok video with some students who may or may not be making fun of her. Um, and then we get the first actual interaction between her and Paul. And I'm actually. Uh, watch this. All right, so Cindy, you got a very warm welcome. Is that normal when you step on campus? Yes, you see students spot me and they want selfies and sometimes they'll even follow me to the preaching spot. And you got some flowers there as well. Yes. So students will give you gifts? Yes, he said he's a big fan and I'm loving my roses. Like I say, I do have to wonder how much these kids are making fun of her or mocking her or if they are actually just trying to be nice to someone they think is a silly old lady. Like, throughout this video, I'm like, is there actually anyone who takes her seriously? Or takes her as seriously as she thinks they do? You know what I mean? Paul then asks Cindy for one of her ho no mo badges. And <laughs> never be not funny for me to say that. And this whole interaction is really odd because I can't tell if Cindy knew Paul was going to be here. It's like she's just interacting with a random person sticking a camera in it. Anyway. My question is, was this an official planned collab or did Paul just turn up one day and ask to film her? I don't know. Either way, um, she gives him a badge. She talks about how calling people hoes is saying they can change and gives them hope. And he has to spell his name out for her to write it on the badge she gives him. So I really do feel like this is their first meeting. Very, very odd. Can I get a ho no mo button? Yes. I gotta be repping it. Show us, show the camera. Why do you, I mean, these things are like gold. Why do people like these so much? It offers hope. Even if they're not serious about being a ho no mo now, everybody likes the hope that they can change and their life can be better. Everybody can have a better life in Jesus Christ. P-A-U-L. Now, don't worry, this topic of calling people hoes is something we are going to be discussing in depth a little later in this video. We're going to talk a lot about misogynistic language and go really in depth with that and look at some theory. And I've got some book recommendations for you at all, as, as well. Um, but that's coming up a little bit later. There's a whole chapter on it in this video, don't worry. For now, there's just one particular interaction I want you to listen to that we're going to discuss. Are you never a hoe or? I, um, I'm never a hoe. <laughs> oh, never. Are you still video? Should, should, yeah, I'm this just on. This is only for virgins or people that married virgins. So give me that one then. Now, I misunderstood at first what she was saying here, and I thought this meant, I thought she meant that the never, ho, never a hoe badges were for people who were currently virgins or who marry people who are virgins. And I was going to be like, that's not you, Paul. You didn't marry a virgin. But then I realized she meant marry when they're virgins themselves. So... I'm an idiot. Shut up me. <laughs> Not what I found interesting here though. Listen to how p proud Paul is of his whole never a hoe status, as he likes to put it. And at first I wondered if this was why Morgan wasn't in this episode, because like we know Paul likes to rub it in her face and make her feel unnecessarily guilty for not being a virgin when they met and got married, and I wondered if she just didn't want to put up with that from a third party too. Um, but no, turns out she was just ill, so that theory is out the window. But we will see later in this, Paul doing this, rubbing it in her face, calling Morgan disgusting and yeah, it's, it's really bad, really messed up. I do wonder though, if Paul took home a ho no mo badge for Morgan to remind her that she was once a ho. Yeah, he probably did, didn't he? 
Seems like something you do. Never a hoe, Thank only you. for virgins. You know, finding a virgin on a college campus is like finding a unicorn, but it does happen. There are fine men and women on campuses. I'll wear this one then. Thank you. Very good. Cindy then wastes all of our time by explaining the very basics of marketing by teaching us all what a hook is. So Cindy, yeah. what are you hoping um, to accomplish today? I'm bringing the Ho No Mo revolution. Of course, the Ho No Mo slogan is a hook. It gets their attention. And I want to ultimately lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Oh, my uh, BSc in business is really going to good use here, isn't it? But yeah, this is just a big waste of all our time. It's very clear what she's trying to do. I'm just confused why Paul didn't bother to dig any further into this. I would like to have seen him or someone, anyone, preferably someone who isn't Paul, but anyone ask her things like why she uses this technique of shaming people with a catchy hook rather than choosing to use any other method, like, I don't know, kindness and being a decent human being. Ask her if she really does believe this stuff works. Ask her what bringing people to Christ actually means to her. Ask her why she's so focused on this idea of purity and controlling sexual behaviour instead of any other aspects of character or morality. There's so much Paul could have dug into here, but he just chooses not to because... I don't know. Paul's not going to watch this, but if he is, why didn't you ask her these things, Paul? Why weren't you curious? If we just wanted this surface level basic nonsense, we'd have just watched one of her thousands of Instagram videos. Instead, Paul follows up with this scene of being all creepy and all, how'd you do, fellow kids? Feels good to be back on campus again. Doesn't feel like that long ago. I was out here, college student. Welcome home, old boy. Welcome home. So, fun fact about Paul, for all he talks about traditional masculinity and blah 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 blah, his degree is apparently, um, like I did a Google, hoping this is right, his degree is apparently in cosmetology and he really did work as a hairdresser for a while. So what's shocking is that he really does have a degree even though it's not a traditionally masculine one. <sighs> But let's also remember that his not long ago was actually at least 13 years ago. This is just giving me the vibe of someone who like peaked in high school or college and just constantly craves being back in their younger years, you know, and crunchy. That said, Paul and Morgan definitely try and cultivate a younger audience and I feel like he's just trying his best to appeal to them here. So I would forgive him for what he's doing, except I can't because let's not forget that in the Paul and Morgan book that they wrote, that I reviewed on this channel, Paul has this whole creepy part of it where he talks about how college campuses are a great place to make meet your future wife. Campus ministries are often teeming with Christian singles. Each week you get to be around people in similar stages of life. It's a natural place for relationships to form. A little known secret is even after you graduate, you can still make guest appearances at events parties and worship nights. Not that I, Paul, have ever done this. This absolutely just reads as you, a grown adult, hopefully with a job who has graduated, should absolutely go and prey on someone younger and more naive than you since no one your own age wants you. Can't find other adults to date? Here are some barely legal teenagers. <laughs> really bad. And let's be honest, Paul has definitely done this and definitely in a creepy way, you know? So let's just not forget what a creep he is. There's also this weird clip of Paul just asking Cindy over and over about what she's wearing. This clip goes on for way too long so I've cut it down to cut out all of the middle section but it's weird, she's just like, my cardigan's from Hollister, I'm wearing Doc Martin. It, it's just pointless nonsense. Um, except for the little bit where she mentions her husband briefly. Um, but that's never explored either. Tell us a little bit about your outfit, Cindy. Well, this scarf was one of the last gifts, Christmas gifts, I gave my husband, Brother Chad, about five years ago. I've got his mantle. He's the one who taught me everything I know. He started this and led me to the Lord Jesus Christ and my uh, journey socks my favorite place to buy socks and of 
got my Lululemon back. <laughs> I thought this might be like a segue to get into a conversation about modesty and modest dressing and so on like that, but it's not. It's just never pushed any further. I think the point Paul tries to make very briefly later in his live stream is that she dresses like teenagers because she's wearing a cardigan from Hollister, so that's why she appeals to them, but it, no. This is just a waste of time. Nothing is explored, nothing is interesting, nothing has a point. Like, I can't believe Paul and Morgan are actually begging people to pay money for this. Is this really what people want from an interview? Is this really what people think is worth paying money for? Are these really the best questions that Paul and Morgan could come up with? What shoes are you wearing? And then we move on to the section of the video that is kind of the bulk of the actual video itself, and it's just clip after clip of Cindy preaching to this one particular university audience with no commentary or input from Paul. <sighs> Paul never bothers to kind of analyse any of the things she's saying or discuss it or make any interesting points, so we're gonna do it instead. It is wonderful to bring the Honomo revolution! <laughs> Message all the time. Sister Cindy, I'm a ho no mo. I have a boyfriend now. Yeah. Oh, no. Ladies, if you are doing the dirty with boyfriend, uh -huh. you are still a ho. <laughs> and God is not impressed with your fiance. Oh. Married people, and if you are not married, it is what the Bible calls fornication. In other words, the Bible clearly teaches hell is hot, don't be a thought. Okay, so a hell of a lot to unpack here. First of all, is anyone else getting Andre and Solly Asario vibes when she was like, my friends don't count, fiancés don't count? Because I think it was in the last video I made on Solly and Andre Asario. There's this clip where Andre is like, oh, you're not really committed until you're married. A relationship isn't a commitment. Engagement isn't a commitment. I'm getting those vibes from Cindy here. Very odd. Also, I know she's trying to go for the whole trying to be shocking thing, but I don't really think anyone using misogynistic names, like telling people they're a hoe in a derogatory way, is ever okay, regardless of what your reason is. And Cindy doesn't discriminate in who she calls a hoe either. If you've had one partner for 10 years, but you're not married, you're a hoe. If you've had 100 partners in a year, you're a hoe. Because it's not necessarily about what specific behaviors you're doing or your reason behind behaviors or if your behavior is hurting or harming anyone. All she cares about is controlling people and their sexuality for literally no good reason. Cindy is never worried about or talks about anything like like unwanted pregnancy or STDs or STIs. She doesn't want people to have good sex education. She doesn't want people to talk about consent. She doesn't actually care about people having the freedom to choose what happens to them and their bodies. All she wants to do is control people through shame. It's demonizing all sex and sexualities and sexual feelings outside of a monogamous heterosexual Christian marriage. And that is so completely harmful. We've seen time and time again in so much of my content that this kind of shame only ever leads to people having poor mental and physical health and unhealthy feelings about their own sexuality. This is what purity culture does. The book I've mentioned before on this channel for if you need help working through that kind of thing um, or just want to learn more about it, a book that I've recommended a lot and will recommend again is Matthias Roberts' Beyond Shame, Creating a Healthy Sex Life of Your Own fantastic resource, really recommend it. Again though, this would be a fantastic opportunity for Paul to dive into a discussion around purity culture and really examine why he and Cindy both uphold it, but he doesn't bother and again it's a huge missed opportunity and really frustrating as the viewer to see. So to talk a little bit more about this in detail, um, in her book Hashtag Church 2, Emily Joy Allison writes that, and I quote, 
A purity culture refers to the culture created by the specific doctrines about human sexuality that are taught in conservative Christian environments. It can include the chewed gum metaphors and the abstinence educators screaming in your face about STIs, or it might be the kind, hip, small group leader teaching the high school girls that God is gracious and forgiving, but it's still important to stay pure until marriage to your Prince Charming. The delivery method isn't nearly as crucial to the definition as the content of the message. And to bring this back to Cindy, that's what's happening here. She's doing it through being funny and making jokes and using slang terms and all that sort of thing. Um, and she's, you know, it seems harmless because she's this little old lady, but she's still pushing this harmful message of purity culture. The message is still the same. Emily Joy, Emily Joy Allison goes on to write, sometimes people want to uphold those beliefs because they're scared. Sometimes people want to uphold those beliefs because they truly don't understand the interpretive and hermeneutical issues at play, and sometimes people want to uphold those beliefs because they have a vested in because they have vested financial interests in the resources afforded to them by performing the beliefs publicly. Jobs in conservative churches, book deals with conservative publishers, social connections with other people who perform those beliefs, and so on. That's actually again not in my script. But that thing about book deals with conservative publishers and the excuses being made for Bethany Beale recently with her whole, well, she had to write this transphobic book. She had to publish her transphobic book because she had a deal with her publisher. She had a publishing contract. Okay, but she's still putting out harmful transphobic content out there. That doesn't excuse that. This gives us a reason behind it, but that doesn't excuse it. The harm is still being done. Sorry. At this point in the video, I would really have loved for Paul to try and dig into why Sister Cindy believes this stuff, why she pushes so hard on this particular topic, topic, really to figure out why she pushes purity culture so hard. And I'm not just, and I'm not suggesting that he'd have to ascribe one of these motives to Sister Cindy. I'm not saying that he'd have to be like, oh, you're just pushing purity culture for the money, for the this, for the this, for the, like, no, but with Paul, as someone who is pro-purity culture himself, it would have still been nice for him to dig into it a little bit and be like, well, why are you pro-purity pro culture? Why is that so hard to say? And why am I pro-purity culture? And where do our reasonings overlap and align and diverge and so on, you know? Why is pro-purity culture so hard to say? Right, to quickly go back to Emily Joy Allison's writings though. Uh, she talks about the shame felt as a consequence of purity teachings and she says, purity culture is a direct path to sexual shame. Different people respond differently to purity culture and often our privilege insulates us from consequences that people with less, less privilege have no choice but to internalize. Almost everyone who grew up in purity culture exhibits signs or attitudes of sexual shame. And sexual shame is one of the main things that leads churches into silence when someone is abused in their midst. So purity culture is not just harmful generally to people, but it also plays a huge part in covering up and ignoring abuse. Again, I recommend uh, the book Hashtag Church 2 for talking about this, and also, as I mentioned earlier, Matthias Roberts' book Beyond Shame. They are really good resources. Recommend them a lot. At this point, I want to take the opportunity to dive more into the use of terms like ho, whore, and slut, both for shaming and empowering people. So words have meaning. We can't deny that. Words often have multiple meanings, multiple layers to the meanings. The words we use to describe other people have really big meanings too. And honestly, something that I personally struggle with on a daily basis is what words do I use in my content and how do I use them and that sort of thing. As a writer and a literature lover, I'm very aware of the power of words and always want to try and think carefully about the words I use and critically assess the types of words that other people use to fully understand their meaning. But on the other hand, as an autistic person, I also really struggle with things like picking up on social cues, picking up on multiple layers to things that people say. I struggle to understand or use tone correctly sometimes. There are sometimes certain meanings or nuances to things that go over my head. Or I suffer with the exact opposite problem, which is a constant need to over explain myself in order to try and be fully understood. And that's something that a lot of people get very annoyed with me for. People get very angry at me for. 
And sometimes in over explaining my view to try and be clear, people will call me selfish or self-focused or whatever. I've recently learned that's an autistic thing and it's something I really, really struggle with and I'm not quite sure how to overcome fully. So the point is, on a personal level, I am very aware of how important but complex language is for both myself and other people. When it comes to these kinds of misogynistic words and labels like ho, whore, slut, this sort of thing, it's not a matter of... And, and other words, actually. It's not a matter of this word is always good or always bad. And I don't think we can ever completely judge a person for using a certain word. Sometimes people use problematic words or phrases out of pure ignorance rather than malice. I think we need to be forgiving of that and open to educating people where possible. And please just note, when I say we there, I mean like as a society as a whole. If you've personally been hurt by a person's words, then it's more, more than okay for you personally to not want to interact with them and you don't have to be the one to forgive or teach someone. But I think we have to be open to the fact that people do want to be forgiving and teach people as a whole. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. So Kate Lister writes in her book A Curious History of Sex, which is another one I've recommended a number of times on this channel and it's really, really interesting. She says that in regards to uh, the words and labels we use to describe each other, language that reflects the humanity of the person or people being described is a constantly evolving process. And while political correctness frequently comes in for scorn, we cannot and will not achieve social equality if the language we use to describe marginalized groups only reinforces stigma. Fantastic point there. So when we see Cindy going around college campuses and making content online calling people mostly young women hoes and thoughts and so on and we understand her motivation for doing that it becomes very clear that she is using those words in a way that is dehumanizing to women and defines their value purely based on outdated harmful patriarchal ideas. So let's talk about these specific words like ho, whore, thought, slut, and so on. I'm gonna get demonetized, aren't I? <laughs> these are words which have been used to put down women for literally hundreds of years and control not only their sexuality and sexual behaviors, but also their levels of self-confidence and independence. Kate Lister spends a whole fascinating chapter exploring the history of these words with a particular focus on words like whore. And one part which really stood out to me as a literature lover, um, is her analysis of a scene from John Webster's The White Devil from 1612, in which one character rants about how terrible whores are and what a danger they are. And <laughs> Lister argues that, and I quote, what is driving this rant is a fear of women, fear that they can wield power over men, that they can teach a man wherein he is imperfect. Here, a whore is not a sex worker. She is a woman who has authority over a man and must, and must be shamed into silence at all costs. Kay goes on to say that historically, whore has been used to attack those who have upset the status quo and asserted themselves, usually in an attempt to reassert sexual control and dominance over her. And I would argue that this is exactly what Cindy is doing with her language and her behavior in her sermons. She's attempting to control women because a sexually confident, independent woman with bodily autonomy is a threat to her, her religion, and the entire patriarchal status quo. To make a judgment of someone's morality based on your perception of their sexual behavior is ridiculous, but that is what Cindy does over and over and over again. One study published in 2020 found that there are quite literally tens or hundreds of thousands of messages being sent on each social media site every day, like Twitter, for example, which use misogynistic insults to put down women in an attempt to control us and our behavior. If a woman steps out of line, she's immediately hit with a misogynistic label, slur, or name that passes some judgment on her sexual behavior. The authors of this article, which you can read down in my source list, found that harassers reinforce traditional stereotypes, consciously or not, by attempting to shame women with labels that counter these normative expectations. Several typical labels include the word bitch, i.e. a malicious, spiteful or overbearing woman, the term slut and whore, i.e. offensive terms for a promiscuous woman, and the word C word, which will get me demonetized immediately, i.e. a disparaging and obscene reference to a woman. 
They go on to say identifying woman as a whore or slut means that she falls far out of line with the norm of sexual inexperience. Again, they go on to write that findings from our mixed methods study show that these aggressive online messages frequently rely on language, suggesting that the target fails to embody traditional feminine stereotypes and ideals, in particular those of physical attractiveness, niceness, and sexual purity. The implicit the implicit message, therefore, is that women should align themselves with traditional ideas of beauty, sweetness, and innocence. That is, there is a correct way to do gender. And while this is talking about online behaviour, this is also exactly what Cindy is doing, both on and offline. Kate Lister ends the first chapter of her book by summarising that historically, if you desire, you are a whore. If you have sex outside marriage, you are a whore. If you transgress and threaten the man, you are a whore. We are all historical Another book I recommend if you are interested in the specific language side of things is Word Slut, A Feminist Guide to Take Back the English, English Language by Amanda Montell. And very, very early on in that book, she points out this very obvious double standard by saying, if you want to insult a woman, call her a prostitute. If you want to insult a man, call him a woman. Uh, later, she goes on to point out that a survey of gendered insults conducted at UCLA found that approximately 90% of all recorded slang words for women were negative, compared to only 46% of recorded words for women. That means there were simply more insults for females in people's everyday lexicon than there were for males. The survey also found a range of positive terms for women, but most of them were, si were still sex-themed like the insults, often comparing women to food, peach, treat, it. She also offers some really interesting insight into the history of these labels. Um, so one thing I didn't know was that apparently the word slut actually used to just mean untidy woman, and even on occasion untidy man, in which case I am a massive slut. <laughs> Please don't clip that out of context. <laughs> I'm just a very messy person. Like as in untidy, I'm... I'm <laughs> Um, over time, however, the definition was extended or evolved essentially to talk about sexually loose and immoral women too. In summary, she says that gendered insults are damaging because they work to propagate harmful myths about men and women. Again, if you want a more in-depth look at this whole topic, then another book I recommend, and again, will be linked down in the video description of my source document, um, is the book Language and Sexism by Sarah Mills. I just want to go off on a little tangent at the minute about kind of language and names and that sort of thing. I know some people don't like me going off on tangents, but if you don't find this interesting, then you can skip to the next chapter of this video, no problem. Um, but please, please allow me this one. Uh, one of the really interesting points that Sarah brings up in her book, which isn't specifically to do with Sister Cindy's content, but is something I think is worth touching on, is to do with names and how they, or the lack of them, are used as a method to subtly put down women. Quite often, actually. Like, one of the things she uses an example, as an example, is that, um, in Britain, surnames have displayed a form of possession of the woman by her husband on marriage, largely because until the 1930s, taking the husband's surname coincided with the appropriation by the husband of the wife's possessions and property. The traditional loss of the name on marriage has been fiercely debated by feminists. And this is actually something that I personally have been thinking a lot about recently. So while I was in Vienna, I read this really brilliant book, fiction, uh, called Wayward by Amelia Hart, and I, I really, really loved it. I was thoroughly enthralled the whole time. Um, it follows these three women in the same family, the Wayward family, over about 400 years. And in it, the family surname Wayward was passed down from mother to daughter for nearly 300 years or so. And with it, kind of magic powers were passed as well, if you want to put it like that. Until uh, one of the women was essentially forced into mar kind, kind of, in, you know, we'll, we'll say it like that. She was a kind of forced into marriage with a man during which she not only lost her surname, but also her independence, her identity, and of course, her power. Her daughter only manages to discover her own power and get her independence after rediscovering her family's surname and history again. The whole magic and powers part of the book is mostly a metaphor for female empowerment in general. Um, and I, I loved it. I thought it was very cleverly done. It was a really engaging book. I did enjoy the fantasy and magic elements as well as the feminist elements. Um, but what really stuck out to me was the surname thing and it got me thinking so much. And I've always said, pretty much always, if I ever got married, I would never change my surname because this is my name. Why should I change it for someone else? Um, and as I've got older, that, that feeling, that value has evolved even further to be like, I don't think I want to be married at all. 
which is absolutely fine. But then this book got me thinking even more that, like, my surname, Oates, is my dad's name. It's kind of a man's surname. It's almost like saying I belong to him. What would my surname be if it had only been passed down through the maternal line? What if I'd taken my mother's surname and she'd taken her mother's and she'd taken her mother's and she'd taken her mother's? And I started like really thinking about it. I was like, ooh. So I asked my mum <laughs> and uh, she, she is big into family history. I think she's traced back some lines in our family back to like the 1600s. Uh, but the furthest she's been able to go with the direct maternal line is back to 1770 with Elizabeth Shaw, my great, 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 great grandmother. So that would, that would be my, my surname if it was all only maternal, you know? Also as a funny aside, I'm just gonna show these messages from my mum because I think it's hilarious. Brilliant, I love that. Love a strong woman. <laughs> and so, again, all of this got me thinking. I've always had like a bit of an issue with people just referring to me by my surname. I don't like it when people just call me Oates. Oats said this, Oats did that, and then Oats did whatever. I always hated it. I had a problem with it before YouTube, and I've had more of a problem with it since my time on YouTube. And there's an interesting pattern I've noticed in that people who like me call me Rachel, people who don't like me call me Oats. And I always wondered, is there something to that? Is there a reason for that? Is it underlying misogyny, or am I just reading too much into things? But now, the more that I think about it, and then I read these books on language and history and that sort of thing, and even fiction, fictional books like Wayward, and I start thinking, like, I think the reason I like being called Rachel and I like people referring to me by that name is because that is my name. That is all mine. It is no one else's. That is a name that was suggested and decided and gifted to me by my whole family, the people who love me and care about me. My sister, my brother, my mum, my dad, my auntie, my grandmas, they all played a part in naming me and essentially gifted me this name that is mine and mine alone. Whereas my surname, Oates, that, that wasn't exactly a gift. It was a tradition that was essentially, that people essentially felt forced to follow, that I have to take my dad's surname because my mum took my dad's surname because they got married and, you know, his mum had to take his dad's surname and uh, and his mum had to take, and, and you know what I'm saying, so on. And so ever since thinking about this and the more, more and more I think about it, I can't get it out of my head that when people refer to me as only ever oats, it's almost like a way of dehumanizing me, ignoring the fact that I'm an actual individual and essentially reminding me over and over that I'm nothing more than my father's property. And that kind of bothers me. And not only that, but that all the women in my family have essentially, or who've had to take the Oates surname over the years, have essentially become property of their husbands, you know? Even the strong women, like, you know, Mary Kilner, like my mum was talking about, and how even the people shamed her for having all these kids and not being married and whatever. Um, even women like that who, who were strong and stood up for their beliefs and didn't want to kind of fall in line with the patriarchy, like, they've essentially been wiped out, like all their name has in my personal line, and just, I don't know, yeah. I feel like when people only refer to me by the name Oates, it's reminding me that I'm not an individual, I'm a product of misogyny and I need to be reminded of that and kept in place. And I'm more than that. I'm not just Oates. I'm also a Fretwell, an Illingsworth, a Crossland, an Izzard, a Duke, a Kilner, a Chapel, a Shaw. I am the product of the history of my whole family, not just one line of men. And I think the name Rachel encompasses all of that. It takes all these people who were there when I was born and who cared about me and loved me and gifted me this name. Rachel encompasses all of that love and my individuality and them wanting me to be my own person. Oates doesn't. Does that make sense? I know, maybe I'm overthinking. Probably reading things too much because, you know. But the point is, Amelia Hart's book, Wayward, that got me thinking about this stuff. Sarah Mills's book on language got me thinking about this stuff. Even Sister Cindy got me thinking about this stuff. But back to the main topic of this section, language. Now, this is not to say that all instances of using words like whore and hoe are bad. I mean, I'm literally here saying them right now in an attempt to educate you on their history. But I guess you could say the difference is that I'm not directing them at anyone. But there are also plenty of people who believe that these are labels that women can, and in some cases should be reclaiming in the name of empowerment. 
There was an interesting little news article published in the New Zealand Herald by Lee Suckling titled Why Being a Ho is No Longer an Insult, in which he writes that to self-proclaim as a thought is to be self-assured in your sexuality. Using it to describe yourself is a form of power. Reclamation of something once used to insult you or people like you and removing it from the haters lexicon. Is it controversial? I think it's not unlike how LGBT plus people have adopted queer as a positive, not a negative identifier. But of course, he then goes on to point out how, of course, context matters and who is calling who these names is really important. So the article goes on saying, that isn't to say it's okay to call somebody else a thought. To say that hoe over there is otherwise derogatory when you're commenting on somebody's appearance or their sexual prowess. This is backed up by um, a great little article post that I read by uh, Selassie B. She wrote an article for a uh, feministing titled Why Ho Is Life, in which she discusses several musicians who are strong, sexually empowered women who have reclaimed the label ho for themselves. There are other examples of women reclaiming labels like ho, ho, slut, and so on, other than just in pop music though. So just the other year I was sent the book Whore of New York by Liara Rue by her publisher um, which is a feminist, which is both a memoir and essentially feminist interrogation of sex work written by a sex worker. There's also books like A Whore's Manifesto which is a self-described anthology of writing and artwork by sex workers. So Sally, however, also goes on to detail about how Ho can be very empowering for, but has also been used against women of colour more than anyone else, which is a really, really important point. In her article, she says that, I should start by saying that personal experience tells me that the term Ho is more popular for women of colour. Slut shaming has been accepted as the official term for judging and mistreating women who are understood to be having sex outside the boundaries of patriarchal respectability. But for many women of colour, slut just doesn't roll off the tongue like Ho does. Using ho is to strategically talk back to the specific vernacular of shame that is directed at women of colour. And as we see Cindy in her sermons using slogans like ho no mo and hell is hot, don't be a thought, it kind of makes me wonder if her shaming language isn't just about misogyny and control, but also has an underlying layer of racism, whether conscious or not. So Sally also discusses events like the slut walk and how black women in particular have responded to and raised concerns about that. She quotes a letter to the organisers from 2011 which reads, Black women in the US have worked tirelessly since the 19th century clubbed women's clubs to rid society of the sexist slash racist vernacular of slut, Jezebel, hot and tot, mammy, mule, sapphire, to build our sense of selves and redefine what women who look like us represent. Although we vehemently support a woman's right to wear whatever she wants anytime, anywhere, within the context of a slut walk, we don't have the privilege to walk through the streets of New York, Detroit, DC, Atlanta, Chicago, Miami, LA, etc., either half naked or fully clothed self-identifying as sluts and think that this will make women safer in our communities an hour later, a month later, or a year later. So Sally then raises an excellent point that there is absolutely a double standard imposed on the way black women are allowed to express their sexuality, one which was certainly overlooked by many of the white women who took to the streets during slut walks. To bring this back to this, the discussion of the reclamation of phrases like ho, she writes, the intention behind using ho as a reclamation is not one of guilt or devaluation. It is a way of neutralizing or lessening the power of a word that has been so often used to harm women. She says, for people like me, ho is more of a political identifier than a descriptor of my actual sexual practice practices, although it can certainly be applied to both. In the same way that I publicly use feminist to align myself with gender nuance and resistance, I use ho to state my position on female sexuality, one of freedom and personal choice. For me, it's a much sexier way of saying that I'm sex positive and that I believe in the rights of people to safely, sanely and consensually have sex with whomever they want, whenever they want. When I see other women identifying as hoes, I recognise allyship and the form of acceptance and relativity, which of course I think is a really important distinction to make and I really, really like that. I think these words can be empowering, but it's essential to understand the context in which they're used and who is the person saying them. I think while we can all agree that these words can be empowering to some, there is absolutely absolutely nothing about the way Sister Cindy uses the term ho which is empowering or kind. Her use of this word, this label, this name, simply is misogynistic, cruel, 
damaging, and I'd argue rooted in racism as well. To go back to Paul's video, these clips of Cindy preaching are interspersed with Paul asking students what they think of Sister Cindy, and on the one hand, I have to give him credit because he included opinions from people who clearly don't have the same view as him, and so I think that's pretty huge progress on Paul's part. That's, that's good. Good on him. Well done. On the other hand, the only question he bothers to ask them is very basic and surface level, and again, I wish he'd dived into these parts further. Ask people about their backgrounds, their beliefs, why they feel these things about Cindy. What are your honest thoughts on Sister Cindy and the message that she brings to campus? I just think she's super funny, and like, I don't know, I feel like when it comes to a lot of preachers, she's like very like compassionate and like super like engaging. I'm not even Christian, but I love listening to her because she like, she's like super relatable. And like, again, like I just like how funny she is. Is the compassion in the room with us right now? I have watched this Fallen Morgan video far too many times now. And in research in this video, I have watched a horrific number of Sister Cindy clips and I have yet to see her display any compassion for pretty much anyone ever. Sure, she's soft-spoken, and she says everything with a really big smile, and on the surface she seems like this nice little old lady, and sure, she makes all her jokes and uses modern slang and blah, 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 but take it all away, and regardless of her method of delivering the message, the message itself is awful. It is nasty. It is shaming people. It is calling people names. It is not compassion or kindness. It is cruelty and harmful. Again, I wish Paul had dived deeper. Ask this student, well, why do you think she's so compassionate? Can you give an example of that? Just anything more than what we got, really. I think she's a, a troll, to be honest. Like, she was like up there messing around and like she wanted reactions out of people. So like, I gave her a reaction, you know, but I don't, I think she's a Christian, but like, She's like doing it for the entertainment, you know? Like, there's no way Sister Cindy's actually like that mentally like confused. It's my opinion. But do you consider yourself a Christian? Uh, yeah, I am a Christian actually. Okay, and you feel like her Christian message, do you think it does more harm or more good? Oh, overall? for sure more harm. Like, there's no there's no one out there who's like looking at her and like, you know what, maybe I, I like, I see what she's saying. I want to like convert to Christianity. I think if anything, she's like dividing both sides, you know? I do have to thoroughly agree with this guy. Uh, he shares a lot of the same views that I do, but again, I wish Paul had dug deeper. Ask him, how do you think she's causing harm? Why do you think she behaves the way she does? Do you think she believes she's really helping people? What about the people who cheer her on and egg her on and go along with her jokes? Do you think they're enabling her harmful behavior? I take my faith seriously, and as someone who wants to bring the love of Christ to people, her making fun of women for lack of chastity, it's, it's not Christian, and she just makes the mindset towards people who might be open to the Christian faith, it turns them against it, and it turns it into a laughing matter, and it turns the mercy that Christ offers every single person on this earth into something that is laughable and a joke, and quite frankly, it's just, it's not okay. Again, thoroughly agree with this woman. I think she seems to have her head really screwed on. I respect it. Again, I wish Paul had asked her more. It's also surface level. And he skips over the actual interesting bits. Ugh. And if you want proof of Cindy making a mockery of Christianity, like this woman says, then just watch this next clip. Here I am with who? I'm Alex. Yes, he just got a Honomo button. Show it. Yeah! I'm reformed. Together, everybody, it's time to be oh. a <laughs> Clearly, this guy is just making fun of her, as are all the students cheering along and chanting her little slogans. It's clear that the majority of people here are not taking her seriously at all. And I just have to ask, who does Cindy think her target audience is, really? Surely most actual Christians who believe in this purity culture stuff would see that she's turning the whole topic into a joke. And surely the people who don't agree with her stance of purity will also just see it as a joke. I can see why she's been memed online so much. I just don't understand why she thinks people are taking her seriously. It's all very bizarre. I think this is just proven further by all these instances of her calling herself a lil lil ho and oinking at the crowd and the whole crowd cheering and it, it's very weird. I haven't always been a Christian. I used to be a Lolo Ho! Here's another example from a student who can only really compliment her because she's not as aggressive as other street pe preachers. But he also admits that uh, when she's on campus, he sells his own t-shirts and merch to mock her and her slogan. So, 
Yeah, it says a lot, doesn't it? I think out of all of the quote unquote religious nut jobs that have come on campus, she's pretty bottom scale on terms of aggression. So I'm here for it. We're all having fun. But I don't believe that she's using the word of God to the fullest intent to actually better people. I think it's just kind of not screaming at, which is most of the people with the uh, pickets and signs do. But I'm, I'm out here selling t-shirts as a counter protest because I, I think it's funny and I'm putting my marketing degree to good work. I mean, I do have to commend him for that. It's pretty smart. Like, even Bethany Beale would be proud of him. This next clip, however, confused me a lot. So Jeff Dunham says controversial stuff all the time and he's still running. And Sister Cindy's doing the same thing, but it's because she carries a religion with her that people have a problem, which is hilarious. There's, and she's a woman. And she's a woman. Now I'm only showing a short clip of these people. There was more. You can go and watch the full context if you want. But even with that, I don't know what to think. Like, at least one of these women is dressed in a way that Sister Cindy would hate and would call her a hoe for, even though, let's be clear, there's nothing wrong with what she's wearing at all. Yet they seem so keen to defend her for reasons that I don't understand. Sorry, but people don't have an issue with her just because she's making edgy jokes. They don't have an issue with her just because she's a Christian. They don't have an issue with her because she's a woman. It's because the message she's spreading is offensive and actively harms a lot of people. I don't see how calling out her misogyny is a result of our misogyny. It doesn't make any sense. People, we, people would be just as mad, maybe even more mad, if it was a man saying these things. Cindy's gender has absolutely nothing to do with the outrage against her and everything to do with what she's saying. And to ascribe any critiques of her to just misogynistic malice is just unhelpful, isn't it? Speaking of terrible critiques, uh, Cindy then tells Paul that she thinks the reason millennials hate her but Gen Z love her is because millennials have no sense of humour, but Gen Z can laugh at themselves. You mentioned earlier that overall millennials are not fans of Sister Cindy, but Gen Z really likes you. Why yes. do you think that well, is? Well, millennials have no sense of humour. Oh, I'm a they're millennial. They're so negative. <laughs> yes, there are a lot of great millennials and I love the millennials. Gen Z they can laugh at themselves and one of the first lessons in life is learning to laugh at yourself so she's really just missing the point that most of these gen z people are laughing at her not with her and the millennials that she thinks have no sense of humor it's just because well i guess we're a bit older and most of us have had the time to learn about and process the damage that people like sister cindy do in the world so we spend less time laughing at her and more time concerned over how dangerous she is. That's it. I find this, I feel like Cindy is this crazy phenomenon because she is preaching hard stuff and using language that even makes my jaw drop, my never a hoe jaw drop to the floor. And I'm just like, she is savage. But then I see this crowd that is just like leaning forward hanging on her every word obviously they're like chuckling and all that but like they're very engaged and it's just this small elderly woman with such an engaged crowd and she is preaching i mean you know, she's combining entertainment she's combining a raunch if you will but it's like she's speaking their language and so you can have all these people that i'm sure many do not agree with what she's saying but they show up and they listen and they engage with her and it's fast. I feel like we're witnessing a phenomenon. Good job, Paul. Super insightful. I'm so glad you're here. The last probably quarter of her time on campus was very sober. It was very sincere. It was uh, a more intimate crowd, more heartfelt. And she did a, a genuine altar call. I was getting a little emotional. It was really amazing. I. I guess I didn't necessarily expect that um, just from all the, the stuff I had seen, all the viral clips, but like it was very real and raw and beautiful. Paul talks about this a lot in the live stream he did with Morgan after this video was released um, about like how emotionally good and how she was doing serious preaching and you be be. Take a look at this, but be warned, there's a really awkward moment of Morgan just ignoring Paul when he speaks. These two just do not like each other. I, oh God, you cannot convince me they do. Three. 
says, I went to Sister Cindy's Bible study this week. It was so great. And that's something that I think we need to be mindful of. <laughs> like, how did the sermon, the what, whatever you want to call that, her four hours on campus, how did it wrap up? It was, there was an altar call. Like, it, it got sober. There was the mm-hmm. gospel preached. And then she's inviting people to come join her for her Zoom Bible studies, where I'm sure it is also more intimate and in depth. But she definitely has. Someone actually commented and said I was in the Bible study this week and it was so good. So that's really cool. Yeah, I just I just read that. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Pregnancy brain, y'all. I am very pregnant. Okay. So again, it seems to me that Paul is really just viewing all of this at a very basic surface level. She can say what she wants as long as she ends up quoting the Bible and gets people to pray at the end of it. I really thought this series, this 24 hours with, was supposed to be about appro- uh, about exploring different approaches to Christianity, but Paul has never once really bothered to dig into his own beliefs or anyone else's really and ask, well, why do you think that specifically? What do you think the consequences are of having this belief? The consequences for yourself and other people. Um, Instead of just, oh my good, they're listening to her and the next three people prayed with her. How about you ask things like, okay, but what about the people who disagree with her? Why do they disagree? Why do they believe those things? Should he, Studies show that this type of shame-filled preaching damages people in X, Y, and Z ways. Let's challenge Cindy on that and ourselves and see if we can find a way to justify it all. But like, I don't know. I just want to see more critical thinking than Paul seemingly has the capacity for. Back to the main video, and this is followed up by Paul interviewing a student who was really positive and basically said that Cindy changed his life for the better. Can you tell us um, kind of what compelled you to go up? Just like, I mean, from the start of like the message, like it essentially is like, yeah, you, if you sin and you live a life of sin, then like, then like sinful things are just going to happen to you or just bad things are going to happen to you. And like, she made some really good points about like, um, especially with lust, particularly like, yeah, it's the whole, the whole shtick is like, yeah, slut shaming, we're out here to slut shame. But like, I mean, who else is going to say it? That's the thing. Who else is going to call them, call, especially college kids, who else is going to call college kids out for it? It's not an attacking way or like all of you are like sinners, you're going to hell. It's like here, here's what you're doing and here's how you can fix it. And here is like how you can give yourself new purpose. The self-gratification, I have never, I've never heard anything that spoke most, like that most to me, like self-gratification. Because I'm going to be honest, that's how I've been living. The whole self-gratification and like, it's a horrible way to live. You can't live to satisfy yourself. Are you going to look back at today and say something happened today? Like I yes. made, I made a decision yeah. today. No, it was, it was moving. I'm going to read a Bible. <laughs> I haven't picked up a Bible in probably six years. Woo-hoo. I want to say Sister Cindy was enough to like genuinely move me to something like that. I just thought it was going to be a funny little sit down, you know, laugh a little bit, preach with her, sell, yell some things. But then it the just viral like, clips that you see on TikTok and everything. Yeah. Like it's like, it's kind of cherry pick, like, but there's like, there's a larger message to it. It's, you just got to watch it yourself. <sighs> I mean, good for him, but I really hate this idea of like, well, who else is going to say it? Who else is going to slut shame if she doesn't? Because that's the point. It's not that she's the one saying it that's the problem. It's what she's saying. It's the slut shaming in general that's the problem. Slut shaming is stuff that doesn't need to be said. It shouldn't be said. No good ever comes from shaming people in this well, actually. I guess it depends what side you're on. If your intention is to control women and get them to stay in their place and do what you want them to, then yeah, slut shaming is a great thing. But if you actually care about women being psychologically and physically healthy and having high self-confidence and self-worth and maintaining bodily autonomy, then it's absolutely terrible. Cindy and Paul clearly care about the first one, I care about the latter. Meredith Ralston points out in her book Slut Shaming, Horophobia, and the Unfinished Sexual Revolution that slut shaming works as a way to embarrass, humiliate, and police women and girls for real or suspected sexual activity that is not considered socially acceptable. Shaming works very effectively, as we will see, to control and constrain women's behaviour. She goes on to say more specifically that whore stigma and slut shaming legitimize violence against some women by contrasting women on the basis of their sexual status and leads to the control of all women. 
Again, this is what Cindy plays into in her preaching. She is dividing people into categories of hoes who deserve to burn in hell and will burn in hell and bad things will happen to you, as this student said. Um, the second category of hoes no mo still sounds wrong out my mouth, <laughs> who are allowed to be in the good group now, but will still be shamed by Cindy and others repeatedly for their past behaviours and made to feel lesser than, and those in the never a hoe group who feel justified in their judgement and mistreatment of all the others because they are in this special group above the rest. What Cindy is telling people and what this student in particular is hearing and internalising is that if a person behaves in a certain way, and not even in a way that harms anyone else, but that just safely fulfills their own desires, then they deserve bad things to happen to them. They deserve to be bullied by others. And if you bully those people, you are justified in doing so. And that is so dangerous, so harmful. In Leora Tannerbaum's book, I Am Not a Slut, Slut Shaming in the Age of the Internet, she writes that slut shaming and slut bashing are a form of bullying, I argue, because it is verbal harassment conducted repeatedly over time in which a girl is intentionally targeted because she does not adhere to feminine norms. Cindy is, Cindy is undoubtedly a bully and is encouraging others to bully too. That is all there is to it. Then the last part of the main Paul and Morgan video is Paul interviewing Cindy back at the host house and again we get a lot of repetitive stuff that's already been said throughout the video. There's no real depth to these questions, nothing very interesting or new, but let's take a look at a few choice parts together. This is Paul asking Cindy to talk about the margarita song that she went viral for. Okay, I've had the margarita sermonette for years. If you buy her one margarita, she will spread her leg. It's never been something I would have put online because it's not appropriate. Okay. But I'm scared. All my stuff is online because they film it and put it online. That chick angel lifted my sermon and made a rap song. Have you heard it? I think so. I, I think yeah. I maybe it, maybe it was like, oh, one margarita. I maybe pushed pause on it. It was starting to get a little. Give me one margarita. I'm gonna open my leg. And she was almost true to pretty much what I said. Okay. When it became viral, that was in June of 2023, last June. They had me at the beginning preaching, and then she was given the rap song. That but the Lord just gave me a piece and he said, I've got this. And one week later from when it became viral, he gave me my margarita song that you heard me do on campus, but I don't sing it. One margarita and you start to slide. Two margaritas and you lose your pride. Oh. I did sing it when I recorded it with my daughters because I don't have a singing voice, but you know how they can fix it on a recording. Yes. And I published it as, um, you know, an alternative to the One Margarita song. I like yours better. Drink one margarita and you start to slap. Drink two margaritas and you lose your pride. Drink three margaritas, you're empty inside. It still packs a punch but it's the clean version. Basically, in summary, Cindy had a sermon about if you buy, how if you buy a girl a margarita, she'll have sex with you and lose all her value and morality and blah, 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 blah. So some rapper made a song mocking it, and then Cindy made a terrible Carissa Collins-esque style song in response, which is just as horrible to listen to as anything Carissa has put out. It's a mix of slut shaming again, but also these weird misogynistic ideas about men always having to pay on dates and how if a man pays then the woman must owe him something sexually. Very, very harmful. There's also all kinds of weird messages about alcohol making people drunk and promiscuous and blah blah blah. It's bizarre. Like, one, I can buy my own drinks, thank you. Two, I don't often get drunk, but I do enjoy the taste of a nice fancy cocktail or a glass of wine every now and again. But some people drink just because they like the taste, not because they want to get drunk, you know? And three, while some people choose to use alcohol as a bit of a social lubricant and can still make their own choices after a drink or two, if you're purposely trying to get a person drunk so they have sex with you, that's not sex, that's rape. 
Cindy is all like, if you buy a girl a margarita, she'll open her legs. And that's meant to like shame, shame the girl, right? But in reality, what she's talking about is a man plying a woman with alcohol so he can have sex with her. That's sexual assault. That's rape. I really do wonder why Cindy never bothers to discuss discuss actual important topics like rape. It's all just, I went viral online, they must all love me. Ha ha ha. I would have liked Paul, or again, someone, anyone, to really challenge Cindy on how a lot of her beliefs and her values and her teachings, how that affects people in the real world and how it plays into rape culture and the justification of sexual violence against people, mostly women. I would like to see her challenged on that and see how she responds to it. Paul then asks a question from one of their Patreon supporters to Cindy, which is this. Our patron Luke said to ask, uh, he said, I'd be curious to know how she reconciles her language slash choice of phrasing. You let him put his penis where? With the call to speak with grace as though seasoned with salt. Colossians 4, 5, and 6. I do find it very funny that their example of vulgar language is her just saying the word penis. <laughs> Made me laugh. So you just, some, some of your more vulgar, abrasive terminology, phrasing. Well, I think the proverb to the froward, God will show himself froward. So this is a very perverted Fro cult. Fro froward. Froward. That's the King, yeah, King James word King there? James. What's a, what's a more well, modern phrase? Well, it actually means perverted. Is oh, wow. Okay. Not that I am perverted or God is perverted, but you can use what they love and turn it on them. And that's what I'm really doing is saying, is this really what you want to be? This is what you're calling yourself. I guess a person has to judge if I have the grace of God or not, and if my message is graceful. But for me, I just have to seek the Lord and preach what God tells me to preach. I found it interesting. There were a couple of girls super polite in the elevator as we were leaving. They kind of gently pressed on you in regards to some of the vulgar, vulgar language. And I was actually really intrigued by your answer. Can you repeat it here? Yeah, in Ezekiel, I said 17, but I can't remember for sure if okay. that's, but I know it's in Ezekiel. Um, God has the prophet Ezekiel rebuke the women of Israel. And he rebukes them in a very vulgar way. Uh -huh. He says that they have committed whoredoms, and the way they did it, they left their husbands, they went and had relations with the Egyptian men because their private parts were donkey size, and their ejaculations were like horses. So it's kind of like people getting really on you for some of the terminology you use. You. And I just say, they say, you can't be vulgar. And I said, the Bible's vulgar. It's a vulgar book. Paul really shows his ignorance, theologically speaking, here. And Cindy gives a whole lot of nothing as her answer, really. Basically, the Bible is a vulgar book, so it's okay for me to be vulgar, too. And then she quotes the horse penis passage from the Bible. I just, I, let's move on. Please, let's move on very quickly. <laughs> Next up, um, I want to play you two clips which were featured in the video about three minutes apart. What's funny is, well, the second clip I'm going to play is the one that was actually in the video first, but it's funnier to see them in this order. Basically, they show Cindy's lack of consistency, her hypocrisy. I, I don't even know how to describe it. Just listen to this. Where did you get the idea of ho no mo? Okay, I have to confess, it's not original with me. Gasp! There are lots of things show, show us the pen. <laughs> that preachers say that are not original. So we had been saying it for years. And it became viral and connected with me. It was just one of my many lines. You, could, I have a, a list of one-liners on my phone. And um, I've been using one-liners. My husband was the master of one-liners. So was Holy Hubert Lindsay. I take what I do very seriously. I have heard street preachers confess that instead of praying and seeking the Lord, 
they just go out and use one-liners. And those preachers were against me, like they put that on me. Well, I don't do that. I've never done that. I've always sought the Lord. So do you use one-liners, Cindy, or do you not? Is it wrong when other people do it, but okay when you and your husband do it? Make it make sense. This is ridiculous. Oh god, this video is a whole lot of nothing. But she's directly contradicted herself, like, within about three minutes of herself. Words? Words are hard. If Paul was a better interviewer, he would have picked up on this and questioned her on it, challenged her on it. Instead, he just smiles along like a nodding dog. <laughs> Then there's just a bunch of Cindy calling people hoes again and Paul sucking up to her. Neither of them seem to really be able to distinguish the difference between good and bad attention and publicity, which is concerning. They know they've gone through the hoe phase, they may be going through the hoe phase, they call it, or their hoe era, but the idea of being a hoe no mo gives them hope. And that's why it caught on. And, and yeah. I just went with it. Is that one of the reasons the pins are such hot commodities? I have not seen people try to get their hands on these Hono Mo pins. It is like crazy. I know. They want them is. so bad. And then the fact that you personalize them to the people's names. Yeah, she autographed it and she addressed it to me. I'm very <laughs> proud of it. Cindy then denies being anything like Westboro Baptist Church because she's more popular than them and she doesn't protest things like they do. And Paul agrees, despite admitting that he knows nothing about them. Amen. So you feel like if someone were to see some of your more intense moments and then try to relate you or put you in the same vein as Westboro Baptist, you'd say that's not fair? Well, I don't think they're looking very deeply or very discerning if they put me with the same as Westboro Baptist. Another thing is I've never seen Westboro Baptist have a crowd of people listen to them, but then I've never seen them before. And honestly, that's, crowds? that's a great point. When I've They're seen, protesters, when I've seen a few really. of their videos, the people are either just disgusted by them, and I don't know a lot about them, but just disgusted by what they're doing or like really angry. They go to events to protest certain things or certain organizations, it's my understanding. I've never met them. Again, why didn't he do more research for this? If he knew she was being compared to Westboro Baptist Church, why didn't he at least find out who they are and what they do so he could ask her about it and challenge her? It would take 10 minutes of Googling to even get like a baseline of information. Also, the Louis Theroux documentary on them. That's fantastic, would recommend that. Again, I just end up questioning why I'm watching this. The video ends with Paul thanking Cindy, hugging her and giving the most generic conclusion ever of I was fascinated and challenged and uncomfortable. It's so vague and meaningless. Thank you, Sister Cindy. Thank you for having me. Mm. God bless. My time with Sister Cindy challenged the way I thought about ministry and evangelism. At times I was fascinated, at times I was uncomfortable. We may not feel called to replicate Cindy's colorful preaching style, but perhaps we should make space for it. Are people hearing the good news of Christ? Being called to repentance? Turning from darkness to light? If so, I rejoice. I do very quickly want to touch on another Paul and Morgan video though, because um, after this main 24 hours video was released, Paul and Morgan together did a live stream, which was mostly just a Taylor Swift rant, whatever. Uh, but they did mention this Sister Cindy video for like 20 minutes in it. So I wanna kind of talk about this. The bit I wanna focus on most is Morgan's view here because obviously she wasn't there for the main video. She was ill, she's never met Cindy, but she's exactly who Cindy would call a hoe because she consensually had sex as an adult with another adult who she was in a long-term relationship once upon a time before she was married. Morgan's response to Sister Cindy and her content is concerning because it feels so full of self-hatred, but it's also very short-sighted. She's like, well, I hate who I was back then, so I wish someone had shamed me into submission. Therefore, I believe we should shame everyone else into submission too. There are, there are whole bits of this rant where Morgan goes on about how awful her parents are because they didn't stop her having sex when she was an adult. And Paul is like, ha ha, yeah, I love my in-laws, but you're bad parents. Um, I, yeah, I'm gonna try and cut this down to keep this clip as sh short and digestible as possible, but it's concerning. So, Morgan, uh -huh. the people want to know, are you jiving with the ho no mo revolution of Sister Cindy? Ho oh, no mo, ho oh, no mo. <laughs> I want to get, I want, we want 
your honest thoughts on it. Yeah, guys, I, w oh, I so wish that I could have been a part of that video. I was so sad. It was, uh, yeah, I was so sick that day. Ugh. Anywho, I thought it was a great episode. Paul did a great job. So I thought back to when I was having sex outside of marriage with my boyfriend that I had been in a relationship with for three and a half years. Um, and it was right around I would have been on a college campus if I had gone to college. And I thought about like what would have happened in my mind during that time slash in my life during that time if I walked upon Sister Cindy. Honestly, that's such a good question. <laughs> that's such a good question. And Do you feel like you can honestly think back and give like what your reaction would have been? I think that I can. But, you know, maybe I'm naive. I don't know. <laughs> but here's my thoughts. And I really did. Like, I sat down for a while and thought about this a couple days ago. I was working at a church during this time of my life. I was, I lived at my parents' house for some time. I lived on my own in an apartment for some of this time. I lived back at my parents for some of this time. I was very mentally ill like physically mentally spiritually ill struggling and I've talked about this before um I feel like a lot if not most of my struggle was because I was living in sexual sin with my boyfriend and I knew that it was wrong I didn't have anyone ask me if I was like how I was doing in my relationship I didn't have anyone challenge me in my boundaries slash like, like I would go on trips with my boyfriend and like no one was like, hey, like, how are you guys managing like saving sex for marriage when y'all are going on like vacations together? Like I didn't have anyone doing that. Your mom or dad didn't say anything? No. <laughs> I'm sorry, Tina and Charlie. I love you guys <laughs> dearly. Uh, but come on. <laughs> come on. <laughs> So, you know, if I had been on campus, which actually I was on campus sometimes during that time because one of my best friends at that time, she was going to University of Louisville. And I walked upon Sister Cindy talking about this stuff. I think that first I would be shocked. Second, I'd be annoyed. Like all in the matter of the four hours that she speaks. And third, I would come to repentance. I think that hearing someone say it so matter-of-factly, like, call me out for what I was, I was a hoe. <laughs> like, I'm like, that's just what I was. <laughs> and I'm not ashamed to say that at all. Because Cindy literally says, and don't think you're not a hoe. Because you got a boyfriend now. <laughs> or a fiance. Or a fiance. <laughs> That's not impressed with your fiance. <laughs> yeah, you're still a hoe is what Cindy said. Like, and for s to hear, like, someone who is a Christian look at me, look at the crowd, and be like, you're a hoe if you're out here sleeping with your boy. <laughs> I think that I would have... I probably would have gone off to the bathroom and like wept wow. because I like I needed someone. I think back on that time in my life a lot. Well, not a lot, but when I like am thinking about this type of stuff and talking about and like sharing my testimony, I think back on that time and I desperately needed someone to just hardcore call me out. Like, I needed to hear that because I was over here living double lives, working at a church. Like, what? It's disgusting. Oh, I think about that. I'm like disgusted. <laughs> and like. I'm, as you should be. <laughs> I, I'll just be honest. <laughs> Having sex outside of marriage but working in a church. That. I'm. Yeah. It's if, I, if that were gross. me. If that were me. Yeah. It's like, man. Yeah. I where, mean, where's the conviction of the Holy Spirit? Other than Morgan's overt self-hatred and Paul's obvious disgust towards Morgan 
again, again, there's nothing really that interesting or original here, is there? There's nothing really that deep. But it really does bother me how Morgan is clearly regretting her own decisions and actions for whatever reason, but she's blaming everyone else around, around her for those actions. How dare you have not stopped me, an adult, from making my own decisions? Like, take some personal responsibility. We all do things we regret, but it's on us to be like, you know what? This is the reason why I regret that, and this is how I'm gonna do better in the future. Not to be like, why didn't you stop me? Why didn't you stop me? Why didn't you stop me? You're an adult. Be responsible for yourself. Paul's reaction is very concerning though. There's so much disgust and contempt in his response here. I just don't see him having any respect for Morgan. Like, if my partner told me that I was disgusting and should be disgusted with myself, especially in that tone of voice, I wouldn't be with them anymore. Especially not. I especially wouldn't marry them and have two babies with them. It is so disrespectful. I feel like the more I see of Paul and Morgan, the less respect I have for them. Morgan then uses the same justification as Cindy, that it's okay for Cindy to use vulgar language because people are living vulgar lives and she's just calling them out. I feel like I'm losing brain cells at this point. And sure, there's a line that should probably be drawn of like, we're not going to do this um cross this line just for attention but i don't think cindy's is just for attention i think she's speaking the language of these kids i was living that vulgar lifestyle that vulgar language that she uses like i was living that in secret so she's just speaking it in public and like calling us out for that vulgar Ooh. lifestyle that we're living like i don't think that that's wrong the next clip doesn't really have much to do with anything it's just paul referring to women as females females should do this females i want to hear from you i won't go into the whole thing now but i've but I've spoken in other videos about how referring to women as females in that kind of generic way is quite dehumanizing and misogynistic and it really tells us a lot about paul so i just want to show you Real quick, Morgan, keep going in the comment section, guys. Uh, females, be just be honest. If you were to stumble across Sister Cindy on campus, what would your reaction be? Guys, if you were female, imagine for a moment if you were a female and you were to stumble upon that, what would your reaction be? Then directly after Morgan has been calling herself a hoe and putting herself down for 10 minutes straight, Paul goes and gets his never a hoe badge so he can put it on and rub it in her face as though it's something to be proud of and he's better than her. The whole thing here is so cringy. I thoroughly dislike this. Calling it now, how Maybe much it. How much that a screenshot of me wearing this in our video gets put up on Reddit and they just <laughs> lay into me. Well, guess what? You don't know the context of my never a hoe pin and the what, what caused me to go get it and put it on for this video. <laughs> But they don't yes, care. they do. They don't care about context. They watch it. They just create their own context. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very big on critiquing the ideas and not the people, but with Paul and Morgan, I just find it hard because I just find them so unlikable. You know how sometimes like a person can say horrible things, you can be like, damn, but they're so charismatic, they're so charming, and it causes this kind of like internal conflict in you because it it's harder to pick out the harmful stuff they're saying when it's wrapped up in such a nice parcel and they're so likable. At least we never have that problem with Paul and Morgan. They come across exactly as the hateful bullies that they are. Finally, we get a clip of a viewer asking a genuinely great question. This is about whether Cindy has an authority over her. Is she the head of her ministry? Is she accountable to anyone? This I think is a really, really fantastic question because Paul and Morgan are very much into the whole traditional gender roles thing um, in, in all aspects of their life. And I believe they've spoken about before how women shouldn't be leaders in the church and stuff like that. What's your take on women being pastors? Uh, being a lead pastor, I do not think is biblically accurate. A woman being a lead pastor of a church. I personally, in my understanding of scripture, believe that it does not give the okay or thumbs up for women pastors. And it's interesting to me that so many think that it does but what are we gonna do you know and a lot of people who share cindy's beliefs also have that view so the fact that she is a leader of her own ministry kind of raises some questions and 
you know, how does she justify that? Is that okay? Is there anyone she does answer to? Does she have any kind of man leading her as people like that normally believe women should have? Does that make sense? So I would be very interested to see them challenge Cindy on this and to hear what her justification for being a woman in charge is. But sadly, Paul and Morgan are just like, we don't know. And they move on. The, Ar <laughs> the Archon says, one thing, does Cindy have any accountability in her ministry, any leadership over her, etc.? And that is a fair question that I did not ask, I would assume, but I do not know. Yeah, I would assume yes, but no clue. <laughs> <laughs> but no clue. <laughs> <laughs> just drop a comment and ask and maybe she'll respond in the comment section after this video is it's boring it's frustrating did they really not plan at all before they went out there god's sake and that's where that part of that video ends too in conclusion final thoughts this is a complicated one i feel like interviewing and making a video with sister cindy had a lot of potential that they just didn't meet I think there are a lot of important topics which could have been explored. The idea of shame playing a huge role in religion in general, especially in regards to purity culture. I would like to see them challenge her on how slut shaming plays into rape culture and um, rates of sexual violence and things like that. I would have liked to see more of Morgan and Cindy's backgrounds each being explored side by side to see if there are any similarities in their journey. I would like to see Cindy talk about talk more about how she changed her mind and stopped what she calls her whole lifestyle. I'd have liked Cindy to have been questioned and challenged more on her preaching tactics, not just a couple of basic questions about, oh, you're saying vulgar, but I'd have liked it to go deeper. Ask her why she chooses to take the hateful slash shaming approach instead of love, kindness, instead of love, kindness, and acceptance. Ask her about the misogynistic and racist undertones of the language she uses. Ask her why she chooses to use them instead of anything else. Ask her if she's ever change considered changing it. I would have liked to see a real exploration um, of if people think Cindy can get away with being more hateful towards people because she wraps it all up in this sweet little old lady persona. Let's say a six foot five man said the exact same things as Cindy. Would he be treated in the same way as her? I don't think so, but let's explore it. Let's see if he would. Let's figure out why. I would have absolutely loved to see how Cindy would have responded to someone directly calling her out and telling her, I think you're wrong about X, Y, and Z. Would she have actually been able to reply or would she have just resorted to, well, I think you're a little, little ho or some childish name calling like that? What I will say is that I did come away from this leaning more to the side that she's not mentally ill. She seems completely put together, but you never know from a video, do you? She just seems a bit stupid and naive is all. She's clearly not able to distinguish between when people are laughing at her and when they're laughing with her. And that's the main way I think she's being taken advantage of, to be honest. If she was showing any signs of mental illness, then I might be more critical of Paul and Morgan for making this video. But as it stands, I don't think there was necessarily anything wrong with them talking to her, featuring her. The problem is that they weren't smart enough to make it interesting or to actually challenge her on anything or to create content that people actually want to watch. I don't necessarily think there's anyone being taken advantage of in this situation. It's just a whole bunch of unintelligent people having an unintelligent conversation. But I might be wrong. I absolutely do not have all the answers. That's where I think I'm going to end today's video. Thank you so much for watching. Let's jump into my regular outro. I'm just gonna jump in here now with a little bit of self promote pre pre-recorded nonsense because I always forget to do this. So if you did like this video, then please don't forget to leave a like or leave a comment or both because it really helps with getting more people to watch my videos. Feel free to share it around on social media if that's something you would like to do. Um, and if you're new here, it would be absolutely wonderful if you would subscribe or if you've been around a while, maybe just check your still subscribed. That would be really great, thank you. If you do want to see more of me, I do have a second channel where I post little vloggy bits, some little art bits, some makeup videos, just some little me ranting type bits, and also clips of some of my longer videos. So you can go check that out if you want. I also have a personal Instagram account, which is mostly me just posting my photography, my dog, my art, my friends, fun stuff like that. Um, and if you'd like to support my channel, you can do that via either Patreon, where at the higher tiers you can get exclusive stickers and prints designed by me every three months, or you can go check out my merch where I'm adding new designs all the time. My most recent one is this really fun Colleen Hoover t-shirt, which is like, I survived Colleen Hoover and all I got was this stupid t-shirt. I love this design, it's so fun and it makes me giggle every time I wear it. Um, I'm also at the minute putting together some Colleen Hoover bingo cards for you that you'll be able to download free off my website, which is quite fun. So the next time we do a Colleen Hoover video, you can download one 
the cards, play along and check off the Colleen Hoover tropes as we go. It's gonna be really fun. If you want to check out my website and keep an eye for when they're available, it's just rachelotes.uk. There's also a bunch of my photography on there, my art, some little rambling posts about makeup, some book recommendations, a little bit of everything. You can just go have a look around if it takes your fancy. But anyway, if you have made it this far, thank you so much for watching today. I appreciate you so, so much, and hopefully I will see you again very soon. Bye.